Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Lunchtime Talk. So these talks are live every Friday at 1 p.m., both here in the building and live online. Hello, online folks. Um, so whether you're in Bristol or you're far away, you can join in the conversation. So my name is Martin O'Leary. I am the studio community lead here at the studio. I'm a white man in my 40s with long hair and a beard. I'm wearing a dark T-shirt with brightly colored crystallography diagrams that probably are not showing up well on uh, camera. Um, and uh, yeah. Every Friday, we throw open the doors of the Pervasive Media Studio for Open Studio Friday, uh, where we offer you the chance to spend some time in our space by hot desking alongside our residents and staff from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, especially big welcome to anyone who's new to the studio. Can anyone who's new to the studio put their hand up? OK, we've got quite a few today. Welcome. This bit is for you. What is the Pervasive Media Studio? Um, we're a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art. <laughs> And we're a partnership between Watershed, where we are right now, uh, the University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol, and we're funded by Arts Council England. Uh, and what we do is we offer studio space, desks, meeting rooms, events, and opportunities, all for free to our residents as part of a spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. Um, and we're a space for people to take risks with embryonic ideas and to make some time for collaboration. So uh, a few notes before we start. Um, Please feel free to move around as a kitchen back there. You can make a cup of tea or coffee, grab some water. Um, please don't use the microwave. Um, we have a quiet space just through to the, well, to my left, to your right, uh, through this wall here. Uh, if you need to take a break at any point, you can just pop in there. It is surprisingly well soundproofed. Um, we are not expecting a fire alarm today. If there is a fire alarm, that is probably real. The studio team will direct you to the fire exits. But in any event, they are at the other side of the studio at either end. Again, to my left, your right. Um, and there are accessible toilets, including baby change. Don't see any babies, but you never know. Uh, in the corridor over there, just next to the kitchen. Great. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end of this talk. Uh, those of you who are watching online, please pop your questions into the YouTube chat. Emma is at the back here. She will be your voice in the room. Uh, if you're in the building, please raise your hand. We'll send around a microphone so that the folks at home can hear what you're saying. You can get news on all of our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio at mastodon.social on Mastodon, and at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. Right, that's all that out of the way. Our speakers for today are Francesco Bentevegna and Katie Dadac. Uh, Francesco is a lecturer in digital theatre at the University of Bristol, and Katie is a comparative literature PhD student and part of the Centre for Creative Technologies, also at UOB. Uh, and they're both going to be talking about their upcoming project, Queering AI, which is an exploration of artistic responses to the marginalisation of trans and queer folks in speculation surrounding the future of AI. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Francesco and Katie. Um, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you to the PM Studio. Uh, can you all hear me fine? Yeah? Cool. Um, so, yeah, just a little introduction. My name is Francesco. I'm a day them. Uh, my pronouns. Uh, I'm wearing uh, green gila. Green? I don't think it's green. Yeah, I look like a queer electrician. So that's, that's me. Um, then I'm going to leave Katie to do their introduction. Hi, I'm Katie. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a white person with oh, yeah, white brown person. hair. And I'm wearing um, black jeans and a black shirt and black shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this is the second talk that I gave at the lunchtime talk PM Studio. And I just realized that I was wearing the exact same jumper, so I needed to put a gilet on top to avoid that. Uh, enough with that. Uh, so today we're going to talk about some of the projects that we run, some of the projects that we are running. It's nice to see a lot of people that came to our projects before, and some people that hopefully will come to our newest project, which is Querying AI. Um, there's going to be some academic exploration, so don't worry. Some of the words are a bit wild out there, but that's how we try and engage with things. So yeah, feel free to ask any question at the end. And yeah, a big shout out to... Oh yeah, so um, the graphic designer who's done for our new project, Querying AI, it's called Tommy Bretnell. A lot of the illustrations are going to be throughout here, but also on our posters, um, which you can kind of see dotted around the um, studio. And if you want to check out their stuff, it's Piggy Bank Shoe on Instagram. Cool. So who we are and why are we here? So we started, uh, the moment we started at the University of Bristol, 
thanks to two people that are in the room, actually, Ed and Paul. They put us together to um, co-run a reading group and the Future Speculation Reading Group, which some of you that are here in the room attended and keep coming, so thank you so much. But uh, in this reading group, a lot of conversation started floating around AI and about around queerness and what it means to engage with technologies. And then Katie and I were like, you know what? Actually, there is something interesting to explore. How do we bring together academics and non-academics, creative technologies and artists, and think through what it means to be queer and working with technologies and especially creative technologies? So from that, we started exploring and we created a series of workshops that we're going to talk a little bit more later about. But today is about querying AI. So we decided to start with some social definition. Because what does it mean, artificial intelligence? What it is? Well, I've put my three favorite theorists around artificial intelligence. But the first one that I'm going to say is none of them. is by Wesley Goatley, who says that AI is a brand. So the way that I understand AI, and the way that we understand AI, is as a brand. So as something that is an umbrella term to talk about, something that Pasquinelli defined as a series of crystallized process of algorithms that are put together to extrapolate data and turn this data into an organized version of that data. Or Alex Fofega that says that AI is a way of talking about computers' possibility to do things that humans do but badly. And uh, Kate Crawford that says that essentially AI does not exist. There's nothing like AI, artificial intelligence. What does it even mean? It's not artificial, it's not intelligence. So this is the way that we want to approach AI, and this is the way that we engage with AI. Something that doesn't exist, something that is a brand that is imposed upon us in a way or another, us as queer people and us as people in general. So how do we navigate this space? What do we mean by navigating the space as a queer space? Is it even a queer space? That's why we decided to engage with queer theory and what we mean by queering in this case. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I guess we begin by thinking what is queerness? Um, how do you queer something? Um, and we come, the, come from the approach that rather than it being an individual stable identity that you inhabit as kind of a um, version of a neat social categories. Um, it is, as Lee Edelman, um, a queer theorist, writes, a zone of possibilities in which the embodiment of the subject might be experienced otherwise. So it is a position of opposition to presentations of stability, an identity that disrupts and troubles cis heteronormative structures. And as queer people, we disidentify with the normativity that is imposed on us. Um, following queer feminist and critical race scholar Sarah Ahmed, Queerness is also a form of relationality and orientation within the world. Um, we queer bodies experience the contours of the world in particular ways, especially as they intersect with other axes in the matrix of ma marginalization. Um, so it's always a space welcoming of all genders that is decidedly anti-racist and anti-ableist, trans, crip, with no room for any kind of isms. Um, we become queer in our relationships to others and to our environments. It is a communal identity and a political affiliation. We're constantly reshifting to our community and to our kin to negotiate space rather, to attempt to, rather than to attempt to make a claim on that space. Um, queerness is also inherently activist. It's a practice which, in which we care for one another, but also a practice of antagonism and anger and frustration with the world around us. So kind of how do we map, those, map um, this kind of practice um, when we intervene with technology and AI? Um, as um, Fran has um, said, uh, AI has, is a brand which categorizes, makes sense of, sorts out different identities. Um, and this is felt in an incredibly embodied way. This redu reductionist logic is usually kind of what where we begin to start challenging, well, what we begin to start challenging, sorry. Um, so rather than identity, it is an approach. So it's not just that we're queer and we're working in and we find ourselves working in tech, but rather it is a practice and approach that we use in everything that we do. 
Um, so in terms, yeah, sorry, that was that slide. <laughs> um, so just to kind of give you a slight background on some of the queer approaches to AI that are happening and the queer kind of theoretical conversation around it. Um, in an article called Discursive Harms in Real Life magazine, Oskies argues that big data and AI is incompatible with queerness. The hetero and cisnormative structures are deeply rooted in binary with ties to power. Um, so they write, to eliminate the fluidity of identities and queer subject positions in favor of clearly defined categories and universally valid taxonomies. If perspectives of queer users are not considered in AI development, those will continue, right? And implicit biases will always persist. Um, however, not as all lost. That doesn't mean we just throw away thinking about AI. Um, a really great recent anthology um, edited by Cliff and Hodge, um, Catherine Costa and Dos Santos Bruce, which is called Queer Reflections on AI, maps a really in, draws, sorry, brings together really interesting theorists um, from kind of exploring representations of conscious AI in weird fiction writer Jeff Vandermeer's um, trilogy to the intersection of neurodivergency and queerness and how that kind of reshapes our understandings of AI and a interesting article on queer, how queer bodies are actually made dirty for digital technologies to claim cleanliness. Um, but the kind of overarching point of the queer reflections on AI is that the emphasis is, uh, which Clippen and Karge um, writes, is the acceptance of paradox and contradiction, the desire to be radically inclusive and to practice humility, which is the recognition that our knowledge is always impartial, incomplete, and therefore open to revision. So kind of from this, how can we explore AI as something for something other than to kind of break it and embrace what Jack Halberstam talks about as the queer art of failure? which is an entailing willingness to fail and to lose one's way, to pursue difficult questions about complicity and to find counterintuitive forms of resistance. By drawing attention to the way AI flattens out multiplicity and paradoxes and equally to the kind of glitches and errors that it produces in the processes, we can kind of begin to start creating technologies and that center the needs of queer people building towards new and more liberated futures. Um, from the kind of reading groups that we do, from the reading group that we do um, and the uh, other workshops, which we'll kind of uh, move on to later, one text which has really inspired us um, and which we draw from and keep returning to is Glitch Feminism by um, Legacy Russell, um, which is a kind of continuation of the legacy of cyber feminism, um, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto and the Xeno Feminist Manifesto. Um, and it's a call to kind of embrace multiplicity. Um, it's thinking about what is the glitch and what that can do as a kind of mobilizing um, way of occupying space within both the digital and the actual um, glitches kind of error. There's possibility to remix your identity. The glitch kind of ghosts your body and you become illegible within these systems. And in turn, you kind of resist the surveillance that's imposed on you and you kind of trouble the logics of the gender binary, capitalism, neoliberalism and all the things that we're um, struggling to live under. Um, yeah. Uh, and as the glitch, after glitch feminism, there's, this ma there's been more kind of conversations around how the glitch can be used as this productive tool to thinking about um, queering tech. Uh, theorist Jenny Sundon compares digital malfunction and marginalized social subjectivities. And there's a really interesting article if you're interested in lossless transmission. I don't know if anyone is. <laughs> um, which explores, by Robert Payne, which explores the disorientation. Disorientation is a queer experience um, and the connection with um, lossless transmission. Um, the other... The next, um, pers the next kind of collective which we're really inspired by is Feminist Internet, which is an art collective that grew from UAL, which um, they integrate the physical and the digital. They emphasize cooperation rather than competition. They aim to eradicate violence, to recode gender, and to kind of educate around um, uh, queer practices. Um, one of their really interesting works, which was kind of a following from Q, which was the first gender neutral voice assistant, which um, started at Copenhagen Pride. Pride. Um, they worked on another um, kind of project called Queering Voice AI, which is a voice interface that um, promotes trans joy and connecting users to queer and trans media. 
And I thought it would be quite interesting to just make, uh, if you're interested, we could. Um, go on. Sorry, go on. I just want to press play. Nope. Ah. Uh -huh. Be interested in that link. That sounds great. Right. Yeah. Enjoy it. I have been told I have great taste. I have more recommendations. If you allow me. Yeah, that sounds good. All right. What genre were you interested in? Can you find me a romance film? Ah, oh, I love a romance. There's a great film called So Pretty. It's about four queer and trans kids in New York. Want to know more? Yeah, that sounds fab. Okay, well, So Pretty is directed by and starring trans and non-binary people. It's loosely based on the 1980s German novel So Schön and has been described as, quote, a quietly radical film about queers, femininity, trans people, and utopia. Would you like me to send you its link? Yeah, please do. All sent. You're gonna love it. Is there anything else I can do? Uh, no. I think that's everything. Thanks. All right, hun. I'll be around if you need me. Until next time. Cool. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> hun. <laughs> Um, great, yeah, so that's, um, so that's a really interesting project if you do want to check out um, on, the, um, on the Feminist Internet website. Um, and the last um, uh, kind of person who, I'm, who we're really interested in their practice, and it's just one of my favourite things to return to, is... Um, sorry. Uh, oh, no. No, I'm just stuck on the YouTube thing. <laughs> Someone who like researches tech, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> it's always the okay. case. Yeah. Uh, Lucas Larachelle, which I don't know if any of you are aware of this, um, but it is a community generated counter mapping project which digitally archives um, queer people around the world, basically. And you can also share your story in the map. So there'll be these, there's these kind of pointers. And you can click on them and you can read stories from around the world. Um, it's really, I just think it's like a really beautiful way of like um, creating like a, a queer space. Um, cool. And that's, I think, it for me. And I think you'll, yeah. I'm just going to move to the next slide. But now it's fine, it's that. fine. I'll go there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. So um, thank you, Katie. Um, so we decided to include a series of people, artists, mm, thinkers that inspired us to explore or querying AI. And because Katie and I come from two different backgrounds, Katie is more on comparative literature and literature and digital theory and theory, I come from an artistic background. I'm an artist myself. What does it even mean? I don't know. But um, I've been working with AI and especially AI in voice as a form of critical thinking around the form of art that we can develop. So we sort of thought we could introduce some other artist practices that inspired our work. Um, so the first one is Jake Elwes. We're going to show you a little bit of a video. Is anybody familiar with Jake Elwes' work? Yeah. So what Jake Elwes did with the ZZ show, uh, they started training an AI system with different images from drug artists. And so they sort of taught an AI how to be drag. What does it mean how you engage with something that is more performative than performance itself? So the performativity of gender and going even beyond the performativity of gender and creating an AI system that is not, it's not even taking performance onto humanity, it's just performance on its own. So that's what was very interesting to me personally to explore. Uh, we're just going to show you very quickly one of the results um, of Jake Elwes. This was mm. one of the videos. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> oh. I just, I'm not like looking at what you're doing. <laughs> Turn 
that the, the, the thinking around this is to, as J.K. will start from the point of view of including identities and even performances of identities that were not originally imagined for an AI. But in this case, there are so many questions. Do we even want to include queers in something that is inherently, in my opinion, although I'm an AI lecturer or something, bad like AI, do we even want to include queer identities in it? But that is a good provocation that allows us to think through what does it even mean to queer AI. But anyway, another person that uh, we were very interested in, and big spoiler, is coming as uh, one of the workshop facilitators, but we're going to explain later, is that Blas, who's been working with uh, the relationship between queerness and technology for the past 20 years. Um, one of Zach Blass' wonderful project is Queer Technologies, a study in 2008, where he and others developed this sort of uh, revolutionary and provoking forms of actual technologies that include queerness within them. So a transcoder, transcoder is a language, so a coding language that is trans within it. You can download it and is a coding language that is not based on binary code, for instance. And we were super interested in the work that Zach Blass has done, especially in rethinking AI. Uh, in the talk that I gave here last year, I was talking about <coughs> AI as a myth and AI as a god. Zach Blass' latest work is on rethinking AI as a god, but disrupting the sacrality of religion through AI and queerness, which is, what well, is happening. I don't know, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, then Kumbira Makumba, this work is called Evo Stern, where uh, Kumbira explored their experience of being a black person and a queer person and how your identities transform them moving with a voice clone on themselves. So the whole experience is narrated by this um, voice clone. It's beautiful, it's haunting. Again, uh, allow us to think through, do we even want that? Which is the main question that we're asking with Queering AI. And then the last experience that I want to sort of uh, give a highlight on is Dandrade and Wallacapelobo, uh, to uh, indigenous people from America Latina, so South America that worked with, and Ed, you might be interested in them. Uh, they worked with immersive arts and 3D modeling uh, with training AI system to explore queerness and indigeneity in South America. Uh, beautiful work, which is part of uh, a very good project that the Academie de Kunst in Berlin developed in 2021 that is called AI Anarchies, uh, to which I applied, but I didn't get it, so I'm sorry. But anyway, I'm just here shouting out to the, those, those who got it because it's incredible work. But um, so these are sort of the inspiration that we had. But what is queering AI that Katie and I are doing? And not just Katie and I, it's Katie and I and Harriet. Uh, but we're going to talk about it later. As we said at the beginning, our aim was to start bringing together academics, uh, creative technologists, and artists that identify as queer, but mainly apply queer methodologies and queer strategies to uh, rethinking our relationship to technology. So we got some funding, <laughs> yay, to do this project that's called Queering AI, which is essentially a series of workshops where we um, invite artists or creative technologies that work with AI from a queer standpoint and explore that together with a community of people. Who is this community? We're going to talk a little bit about it later, but how do we arrive here? Well, we started with the reading group that we said, and then the Center for Creative Technologies gave us some funding uh, from the University of Bristol, gave us some funding to develop this uh, one day, was it one day, mm -hmm. two day, one day? Uh, one day a series of short talks and intervention. Some of you people that are here participated in that, and some of the people that are here even gave a talk in there that was actually very fun. Hello, Jacqueline. And, uh, <laughs> So yeah, where we explored different forms of queer methodologies from an academic standpoint and from an artistic standpoint. So we started from this question, what methods do queer researchers and artists use when they engage with creative technologies such as virtual reality, creative computing and animation? We had Dr. Jacqueline Ristolo, which is here, that gave uh, an amazing 10-minute uh, talk. Then Chloe Maynard, which is a person that has been working with us for quite a while, 
uh, community tech uh, facilitator and an artist. Then we had Ro Dr. Rosie Nelson, another lecturer at the University of Bristol, that did a very wonderful 10 minute short introduction to queer methodology. Harriet Horbin Wally, which is our main collaborator and the person that uh, is one of the co runners of Queer Tech Bristol. And then Marcin, which is a wonderful artist uh, who explored queer body organs. It was a wonderful long day. <laughs> Um, where we explore different things and from that we decided well there are other things that we want to do so how do we do them we organize a core shared reading group session with queer tech bristol in here in this exact space so where people from our reading group which was mainly academics and people from queer tech group which is a group of people that are queer and work in tech and are interested in tech we gathered together we read the introduction to our hockey manifesto by Mackenzie walk and then we read Ursula Franklin, um, a, a philosophical and, and understanding of technology. And that was uh, bursting with ideas from that moment on. So we were like, you know what? Let's apply for more funding and see if we can explore a little bit more. And then we got funding and we did this. Yeah, so this is um, in collaboration with Control Shift. Um, which was a two-day week, two weekend um, called Queer Practices and Creative Technologies. We need to start like, thinking of new names, because uh, <laughs> right now it's just some queer practices. Queer, but yeah, uh, we're becoming more creative with that as we go along. Promise. Uh, yeah. Um, but this was a really exciting two-day event where we invited three um, artists and creative practitioners to um, run workshops. So um, the first workshop was Harriet um, Horobin Worley, who, as Franz mentioned, um, runs Queer Tech um, alongside others. Um, and they ran a workshop called Sound and Vision, Making Our Own Networks, with, Making Our Own Networks, which was a way to re uh, to think about how we can use radio to imagine a future network. Thinking about how we how queer people connect digitally, how we connect like through WhatsApp groups and things like that, and how we can use a radio that is built, owned, and oper built, owned operated, and used by queer people. Um, we were thinking about, the practice was that in pairs, we kind of audio recorded our own experiences of radios and our queer experiences, and how it's going to be creating a project um, around setting up that queer radio so we can listen to those. It, those audio recordings will always be it will always exist on those radio waves. And then the second um, project, the second workshop um, was run by Melt, which is a art collective based in, sorry, an art collective based in Berlin, which we collaborate with. They're really, really great if you want to check out their work. Um, I think it's Melt Meltchenary, like dictionary.com. Um, and with them, we thought about how we can explore and queer the methods of a workshop when you engage with tech. So it's kind of like a meta, um, like a meta workshopping the workshop idea where we deconstructed what methods we use. Often when we're in these tech spaces together, we create collective conditions or codes of conduct. But how do we actually embody that when we do the practices we do and how do we, and how can we connect with the material agencies within the space? So one of my favorite pieces that kind of came out of it was um, a group had taken, had kind of taken everything that they bought, set everything in their bag and connected the different things together. So there was like wire, electric wires and oranges and tablets and phones and so many chargers. And we were just thinking about how we pair those objects together and consider those materials in their most rawest form, thinking about how we can kind of reimagine the new material ways of using that. And then the last workshop on the um, Sunday was um, Yudi Wu's um, What is VTubing and How Do I Make It Gay? Um, which is a great title. And it was kind of exploring how we can use VTubers to kind of touch grass and help local communities, especially local queer communities. So Yudi gave like this crash course on Unreal. And we had some really, really fun speculative designing. Um, we did some really fun speculative designing. We kind of created this avatar called Genuine, who is a queer elder. Um, and we thought about what kind of features would we want in this queer world and things like cat cafe, soft play area, um, free translation AI, um, and yeah, loads of other things. 
And we also made a zine at the end of it for kind of, there's like a digital version as well, which um, I can send over if anyone's interested. Um, but there's also some dotted around uh, the PM studio if you do want to explore the rest of the workshop, uh, the, worst, the, the rest of the weekend, oh, sorry. Um, and then the last thing that, um, something which is we um, are constantly really re like thinking about is um, how are we, which is, sorry, we're constantly thinking about the question of the connection between university and funding from the university and queer people and how not to extract, um, inf like how not to basically make it an extractive and how do we flatten the hierarchy. Um, so we had an open forum where we kind of discussed these feelings. How do, how do these queer participants who might not be associated with the university feel in relation to being in these workshops? And what kind of practices can we create to serve the people um, and not use, not basically extract their knowledge and then publish something, um, which is the last thing we really want to do. So how do we create that consent-based practice? And our next workshop, um, and this is just a quote by Fred, um, by Moten and Harvey. Oh, I just spelled that, that wrong, their last name wrong. But um, yeah, which is just about complicity within the university and what effect specifically we're thinking through it as what effect that has on queer people. So from that, because we've been, we were having quite a lot of conversations around it, we ran a trans feminist and queer value making workshop, um, which is inspired by conversations that we have with Chloe Meineck, um, and also a interpretation of a practice that was developed by Dr. Max Liberian, which I'll reference, um, and the clear lab that they run, um, which is basically about how do we create values together as a community, community rather than imposing from above. Um, and this can this this isn't inherently queer. This isn't you know just for queer uh, to create queer spaces, but really kind of any. Um, space where people are grouping together and meeting together regularly. It's really important to create that consent-based um, practice and create values from the participants rather than us just coming in and imposing the values. So we kind of spent um, an evening thinking about what kind of values we find important. And um, from that, we created a value statement of um, this kind of collective that me, Fran, and Harry are part of, um, or that is just beginning, um, that you know, connects all these different threads together. Um, so yeah, if you want to check that out, and if you want to think about how consent-based, how you can um, create consent-based practices in your own um, work or in your own kind of spaces, I would definitely recommend the um, Max Liberian because I think it's really great. Or message Katie. Yeah, or just message me. Who's very great as well. Um, and then the last, so after kind of um, having this value value workshop, I feel like we felt more comfortable as well starting to do workshop series in a little bit more detail um, because we had this reference and we'd created that space. Um, so our most recent event was the Drag and Drop event in collaboration with Con Omar from Container Mag, well, at Container Mag, <laughs> and um, Queer Tech, where we were exploring how drag has, the connection between drag and the digital space. And uh, Ellie Clark ran a really, really wonderful workshop on creating how we can create drag personas online um, and we kind of held like this dinner party with all the drag personas that we created uh, so that was really fun um, and yeah that's kind of it in terms of like what we've done so far um, with um, our work and the work with Harriet um, so yeah the last thing I guess is just to talk about this next series which is what we're kind of here to plug yeah so <laughs> that was the introduction up until now, yeah. so it's a very long introduction. Jessima, I don't know if any of you have done a PhD, but that was the introduction, which is 15,000 words, now <laughs> the rest. So I hope you're free for the next four hours, because we're just gonna, no, just gonna talk for 15 minutes more. But essentially, I, we sort of thought that it was quite important to guide the listeners to, what, to who we are and why we're doing this. Where we are now is that the two of us and Harriet just built a little, let's say, co collective? How do we call it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Should we call it collective? Collective. Yeah, cool. It's called if Machine Streams. Know, yeah. If anyone knows a better word. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. As you might have realized, we struggle with, <laughs> with naming creativity things. <laughs> for words. So, yeah, queer something? No, no. It's Machine Streams because we have very different streams. They will recognize two. What is a machine in the first place? 
So the three of us decided to uh, sort of expand the idea of having workshops. And uh, we applied for some funding, we received funding, and then that's where we are. We are doing querying AI. What is querying AI? Querying AI is four workshops over the course of six months run by four different artists and creative technologists. It's starting now. <laughs> Literally next month, we have the first one, which is run by Chloe Manick. It's Queer Strategies, where we start from recollecting our past experiences as queer people and what are the strategies that we can implement to change what we think. Then the month after is Zach Blass, coming all the way from Canada to run a workshop on how to queer AI from an artistic point of view. Then Amina Basnazari in September, who's doing a workshop that I've already attended, is incredible, is to create your own AI voice with um, Object Trouvé. So how do you change your voice, how you turn your voice into an artificial voice. And then, uh, mo most likely, uh, we yeah. put it there. We put it there, but it's not Hopefully, completely confirmed. This is about, I, we know that it's in December, but Bahul Desuki, who might come and do a workshop on actually hands-on machine learning and coding. How do we participate? How do you take part in this? Well, because of what we decided to do, oh, which yeah. is, yeah, later, we're, we're going back to this later. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, Where do you want me to go? Uh, stay here. All right. Stay here for now. Okay. Machine streams, yeah. <laughs> the three of us. We have a website. Cool. We have a website. And uh, um, so, how do we get to participate in querying AI? We decided to have a small cohort of people that would attend every workshop. This cohort of people is paid participation. At the moment, we have 75 pounds. Sorry, I'm going into the very basic rawness of it. But we have we decided to pay participants and had food <laughs> at each event. Uh, we have four events for 10 to 15 participants. Uh, we're going to share the form uh, in a second. Yeah. We're going to share the form for you to uh, sign up, and then we're going to randomize the participations. In, in, following something that the PN Studio has done before, because we don't want to prioritize um, people that we already know, but we want to share it with people that we might not know. So we, we decided to have this randomized version of it. Where I'm just going to ask the people that are here, uh, this is open to everybody, but we want to. Pr there is one kind of people <laughs> that we want to prioritize, which is queer identity. So feel free to put your name down, but in, in your own time, prioritize people that, have, that identify as queer, because this needs to be a space for us to explore something that is not always allowed us to explore, which is something that has power, like AI. So the full workshop will work um, two or three hour workshop run by the artist, then a conversation with us and the participant to then arrive to what? A manifesto for querying AI, possibly a toolkit to explore AI from a queer standpoint, publications if we want to do them, artistic responses if we want to do them. But again, it's really up to the participant, us, and the artist to decide on the most um, comprehensive way to address things. That's why we struggled in the past, because we want to, and that's why we did the value workshop, and we did a power mapping exercise to flatten out, but not in a capitalist and uh, yeah, it's flattened out, but actually there's people that hold power. We know that the university might scare people out, but at the same time, we want to use the university as a platform to allow us to explore things. Um, so how do you sign up? Well, yeah, just a quick thing on oh, this. Sorry. Um, shout out to Harriet, um, who created a amazing low tech website, which you can also check out. We're going to be adding more things to it, but just for the moment, you can find out all about our events and workshops and past things. We also want to create a resource list, um, which basically is kind of like um, a, kind of like the Cyber Feminist Index, which was created by Mindy Sue, but for queer, um, queer, fem queer tech feminist um, work. Cool. So, so yeah. yeah, 
if you want to sign up <laughs> to the workshop series, there's a really short Google form um, with, yeah, not a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, uh, and the QR code is there. And you probably have uh, the things. first uh, workshop is going to be on the 4th of May. So our aim is to give ourselves two weeks to uh, collect as many participants as possible, then make the decision, communicate to the participant. Obviously, I know that it's difficult to people to commit things in six months after. So even in accordance with the funding that we received, uh, we decided to have a reserve list. So we have 10 participants that we randomly pick, and we have 10 participants, or more or less, it depends on how many people sign up, <laughs> that we use as a reserve list so uh, people can join in if somebody else is not attending. But what we ask to the people that want to sign up, uh, think about your commitment as something of, uh, we're doing something together. So is the 4th of May, is the 14th of June, it's then at the end of the September, and it's then in December. It's low commitment, but still commitment. Yeah. Um, I guess the emphasis, do you have a question? Sorry, I thought you had your hand up. Sorry. It's fine. Um, just, yeah, I think the emphasis we wanted to give, I guess, was about like, oh, you did have a quest. Wait. Oh, this oh is on Saturday. On so Saturday. it would be on Saturdays. Um, we haven't like confirmed the exact times yet. I know for the 4th of May one, uh, there is information online, um, but it will start at 11 from 3 o'clock, uh, 11 until 3. Um, and for the rest of them, we haven't yet confirmed with the artists. Um, yeah. I guess just the, emph just the emphasis of why as well we wanted to not only, this isn't just like a funding thing as to why we want to do it for a longer period of time, but we really want to emphasize one of our queer values, which is taking everything slowly, taking everything thoughtfully, um, and not kind of, I guess, like succumbing to the pressure of the accelerated capitalism that all scares us and um, makes us feel um, not safe, right? Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. And I don't know where we are. <laughs> uh, so that's the website. Yeah. Um, so this is a, basically the question that we're going to ask at the beginning of our uh, uh, workshop. And this is the question that we constantly ask ourselves, which is, how can we create a community-based practice centered around queer values when working with technology? Um, happy for you to think about that without talking to us. The more, the merrier. Yeah. And uh, future projects, very quickly. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Too quickly, but yeah. <laughs> so we're in conversation with Sparks Bristol um, to run a workshop on hacking pride and uh, what does it mean to um, attack the idea of capitalist and corporate pride from an uh, online perspective. Yeah. And we are continuing our collaboration with Melt with a series of projects that go beyond Bristol, but it will engage Berlin. And we're planning of finding more funding to run mm -hmm. a series of archival research. And the four question marks are, get in touch. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah. yeah, do, uh, we're here. And um, these are our references, I yeah. guess, the next yeah. one, yeah. Just to emphasize references. also, like the general, the project we've obviously said is queering AI, but if you want to get in touch about anything else to do with, like it, is, it doesn't have to be around queer AI, we are interested in way more than that. Um, yeah, just the references if you want to check that out. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, because it's not uploaded. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was, um, yeah. Everyone. And I guess we can end again with a form. Yeah, if anyone does want to sign up, if not, there are QR codes around the posters in the PM studio. And if you do want to email us, we are at machinestream at protonmail.com. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you both very much. Uh, we got a little time for questions. If anyone has any, stick your hand up. Thank you so much. Um, is it possible to have a list of the texts of your reading group? Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. Great. There'll be a list on this website, but also because the reading group is 
the reading group is there's so much nuance with things <laughs> and I'm just there's, so I, there's like map, mapping of different connections but the reading group stemmed out of the Centre for Creative Technology which is um, Ed and Paul's um, Ed and Paul here run <laughs> um, and that's it's associated with that so you can go on their website and I upload all the readings on there um, but if you want to also join email me and yeah what else I just wanted to ask if you guys had any magazines or publications that you would recommend acquainting yourself with for exciting new writing on queering AI. I mean, I would suggest like the real life magazine is really interesting, but that's not to do with that's not so much to do with AI. Um, it's much broader um, relation with that. But yeah, yeah. Um, I guess it, it depends on what you're after. Yeah. But uh, there are specific writers and authors that work a lot with AI and from a queer standpoint. Uh, I've written an article with Kayla Lada McDowell on uh, what is a voice that it was written by me, Kayla Lado, and ChatGBT. Uh, is in the reference list, but everything that Kayla Lado has done is quite interesting yeah. from that point of view. And uh, uh, if you want to go back to our talk on YouTube, you are free to do it, obviously. <laughs> And all of the things that we've yeah. put out there are actually free access, I think. Even the querying AI might yeah, be open access. The querying AI, yeah, that anthology is really, really great. Um, mm -hmm. And it kind of sets up the scene for really contemporary queer reflections. And that is open, yeah, it's yep. open and available. Yeah. Probably others, I just can't think on the spot right now. Any other questions? I think so. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry if I... Fine. Um, you at the beginning mentioned a lot about how in queer kind of, you know, activism, that sort of thing, it's anti-racism, anti-ableism, no isms. You've only really covered off gender and the binary and AI that yeah. intersects with gender, but it also intersects with disability, with yeah. race, with that sort of thing. What workshops are you doing to cover off those intersections? Because I feel like as a community, we often say... We're not ableist, we're not racist, but then actually don't do anything proactive to show that. And that, that was it. Yeah, completely. I guess the first thing is the, just the first thing in terms of setting up that workshop practice, like regardless whether we, we're engaging with AI, regardless of what tech we're engaging with, setting up, um, that was like something that we thought was really important and that we wanted to start creating. So through our kind of collaboration with Mel, which do practice a lot of this, like their practice is on disability justice within tech and within art. Um, so we've been having conversations with them and we've been doing like workshops with them to learn them from us and us from them um, about how we can um, how we can interweave those things together, right? Um, how are we, what were you going to say? Well, uh, no, yeah, exactly. It's that uh, our next uh, project is thinking through uh, queer crip theory and yeah. queer crip relations from an artist standpoint and how it relates to technology. Yeah. And in terms of anti-racist approaches to AI, uh, I think that as a framework is fundamental to engage with text and artists and creators that already have ingrained that knowledge within yeah. Uh, we, I will never be able to claim that I come from that area of study because it's not my area of study, but everything that I've done as an, art, as an artist and a creator, and I'm pretty sure that works for Katie as well, is rooted in Ramon Amaro and Sofia Noble and Ruho Benjamin work on how we dismantle AI from within, from an anti-racist point of view. The reason why we only focus on queering in this sense at the moment is because whereas the intersections are always there, it, we want to slow down and start from what we know at the moment and learn within this space. Mm -hmm. So uh, engaging with Amina and Baru is um, working with artists like Daniel Bright White Shirley, which is an opportunity for the future, <laughs> is something that will teach us and teach the people that want to take part on how those intersections work. Working from uh, working with Melt and Chloe Manic 
again, teachers and teach the participants and each other how the queer crip relation is fundamental and ingrained in it. Again, it's, um, I'm just going to be honest, it's, it's something that I'm not an expert of. I want to learn, we need to learn. More than reading, it's learning um, on practically, and that is why I think that if you're free, especially if you're free at home and you're in Bristol, today at two, actually, at Trinity, one of the residents here, Shruka Lata is presenting that work on um, queer belly dance, or the queer dancer, so it's, it's free to attend, please go. I know it's not Ten that. minutes to get Ten there. minutes to get there, bye. <laughs> bye, that's nice. But no, thank you for bringing that up. This is something that yesterday, for instance, in the power mapping conversation that we had, it's something that we need to address. We will address, we are addressing, especially coming from uh, even in my queerness, for instance, me as a person, I am privileged because I am male presenting and I will always be privileged. My voice sounds male and I will always be privileged. So how do I navigate that? How do we navigate the fact that the majority of the people that we collaborate are white? How do we navigate uh, the fact that, it's fine. How do we navigate the fact that these project is happening in Bristol, which is a city that yes, it's uh, very much about community and creative communities, but if we look around, most of us are white. And what happens in Bristol is you have areas where everybody is not white and everybody's white. So how do we navigate that? I don't know. I'm trying to understand. We're trying to understand. But thank you for raising that. Emma, I have one. Hang on. I'll stand up so you can hear me. Uh, so I've got a question from Tom Marshman online, which is, I'm interested in the disappearance of queer spaces like bars and pubs. Can AI address this bringing people together or does it dehumanize more? That's a great question. And the work of Judy Wu, which we um, had a workshop with, uh, was rethinking the, the, these from a perspective of Queerness, how does queer spaces disappear and what can technology do to intervene uh, is an interesting work and is wonderful and they're developing it into a bigger project on rethinking how we can create spaces online for queer communities. I don't think that, personally, I don't think that AI is a solution for anything. Mm. I think that AI can be queer in a way that that could be one of the avenues where we explore. So rather than AI is the solution, is more, I don't know, can AI be the solution? How is a problematic tool like artificial intelligence, so a problematic brand like artificial intelligence, be the tool to navigate those spaces? But thank you, yeah, beautiful question. Yeah, I don't know, do you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, I guess just about that, like, um, from what I learned from that workshop and just like readings and thinking about like um, the closure of all these queer spaces within Bristol and like beyond, right, is um, how do we like connect that digital and actual space and like listening, like learning from like Legacy Russell and thinking about how that virtual and the actual is not a binary um, and that these things seep into each other um, is could be, would be an interesting point to start with when thinking about how we can use that tech to, um, or how we can use, I mean, as you've said, maybe not AI, but um, how we can start thinking about using these technologies to create the space, uh, to um, intervene with the closing down of queer spaces. Yeah. Any last questions? One more. Thanks. Um, there was a moment as you were speaking where you said about, um, so something about like, AI being bad and do we want queerness to even go kind of go there and um, just then as well you've said that it's problematic and I don't want to challenge that but I just want to offer some time to please unpack that mm -hmm. like it's not a obvious or neutral statement you know that like AI is bad although of course there are arguments for it being bad and I'd be really curious about your position especially with this work mm -hmm. why is AI bad? Do you want to start? start? You go. Um, so I'm gonna try and Start from a uh, current example, uh, the use of Israel, the, the Israel use of AI, um, intelligent bombing, uh, or the use of police 
not just in dream dystopian presence and futures of AI system to catalog white people and not white people to clarify crime, or uh, the use of institutions, I'm not going to name, blame institutions, but I am part of one of them, uh, of AI systems and GPS system to track. track attendance and presenting it as a future or an evolution. That's a future that we want. Is that, so I, I tend to say things like, oh, that is bad. And uh, I know that is an opinionated point of view, but it's, it's more of a, what Katie just said, is this the future that we want? Is this a technology that we need? Because essentially what AI is, is a crystallization of a series of data to do something that humans can do better, as Fafega did, as Fafega says, which is, I'm putting this data all together, and then this data helps me to have a better life. But who owns AI systems? Who's better life? Uh, why are we using it? So querying it, starting from Munoz's definition of queerness, so we don't want to be in this world that doesn't want us. We don't want a uh, uh, capitalist and uh, corporate pride. We are proud of not being part of this. So how do we queer AI from within? I don't know. That's why we're doing this workshop, is to explore ways that we can either dismantle, either engage with it, either destroy it. We can't destroy yeah. it? No, we don't have the power. But how do we engage with it from a point of view of critical queer existence, yeah. I guess? Yeah, that's it. I think that's why the first like, workshop on queer strategies that Chloe will run will be really interesting because it will be about how do we share, how do we like, ease, as like, queer people in our everyday, how do we create strategies to ease our life, right? Or to like, hack our life. And we can, once we kind of create those like, um, that like archive of all, yeah, that archive of those queer strategies, AI, we interact with AI all the time, right? Going online and things. So we can have those queer strategies in the forefront of our mind to stop that extraction, to stop the extraction from happening, or to just feel safer, right? Um, so yeah, it's yeah. yeah. We've got one last question from online. Uh, yeah, another question from our, online. This is from Nick Rawlins. Um, does a queer AI trained and designed by queers offer opportunities for understanding queerness itself in a new way? As in, are there collective, hybrid, or rational modes of queerness that AI could inspire and facilitate? Well, that's the dream, <laughs> I, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, well, again, if we think of AI as a brand and not as something that actually exists, or as a series of process, I guess the response is yes, it could. But again, having these conversations is like going back to your saying, or Dan McQuillan, do we even need that? How do we need that? And I guess the reasoning behind us trying to do this together is to answer those questions, ask those questions from a practical point of view, from a skill sharing point of view, but also critical thinking. So I love Nick's question. Yeah, this is a dream, I guess, for me. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't have any yeah. 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 All right, so then. Cool. Well, in that case, please join me in saying thank you to Francesco. Thank you. All right. Uh, before you all go, if you do want to stick around in Hot Desk today or find out more about what we do at the studio, Please come find one of the studio team. Studio team, give us a wave. Myself and Emma here. There's probably some more people over there somewhere. Uh, we'll be happy to help. If you're watching online, you can drop us a line on studio at watershed.co.uk with any questions. Thank you all for being here today. And we'll see you all again next week. <laughs> Thank you.